Hi everyone, uh, I'm going to be starting my webinar in just a few moments now. So good evening everyone. It's uh, great to be back uh, after the last couple of weeks of being away. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, an interview with Tony Law. Um, but before I do that, I want to just go into uh, a couple of slides of information to share with you. Um, if you like what you hear, from us as an accountancy firm and you want to discuss our services, you can go over to our brand new website, uh, www.optimizeaccountants.co.uk and uh, you can talk about our services in general. But equally, if you like what you hear but you want to uh, talk more about your specific situation uh, regards to tax, not necessarily about what you'll hear from Tony Law, but uh, hopefully I'll throw in some uh, tax nuggets for you this evening whilst uh, Tony goes to his uh, viewpoint of uh, tax uh, property investing. Um, then you can book a call with us as well using optimizeaccountants.co.uk and use the code web25 and that will give you a 25% discount uh, for your 45 minute call. Um, but before we kind of go into the Q&A with Tony, um, let me just give you a bit of a history of when I first met Tony, but actually was at a property investors network event. I then went on the, uh, I, yes, I went on the accelerator, uh, huge uh, learning curve and huge hangover on the second day, which was really naughty. I was there until about two o'clock in the morning. Um, it's a bit of great learning about property investing. Uh, I have a lot to thank Simon Succi for. I can go on record by saying that. Uh, Louise took me on to Blackfriars, a huge event at that time. Over 200 people were going there on a monthly basis, cracking event there. Um, and I didn't believe in property investing at all. I was quite cynical. And then I went on to the event with Simon Zucci, went on the mastermind, uh, but before that uh, on the accelerator. And Tony, funny enough, ran a couple of the uh, sessions and got to know Tony. And it was just really nice to hear someone who I believe gives real value, but more importantly, cares. There's a great saying that Ziegler Ziegler always talks about, um, and I, I, I'm going to screw this up because it's really hot and my brain's fried tonight, uh, but I'm sure he said along the lines of, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's a great thing, which I, I always kind of think about Tony Law, is that he does care uh, and he gives value, and I have a huge amount of respect for Tony in terms of what he's done for the property investor as well in terms of people wanting to learn and indeed hopefully uh you can learn as well from tony this evening uh there are, this is a q a as well so if you do have any questions don't feel that uh, you need to uh, you know sit there in a pool of sweat because it's so hot in this humid <laughs> environment that we are now in if you do have any questions that you would like to put to tony please feel free to do that and then hopefully you can give some insights as well but uh, let's start with you, Tony. Good evening to you, first of all. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Am I coming through okay for you? <laughs> You're coming through fine, although I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to live up to that introduction. But thank you so much for it, Simon. That's very, very kind. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's very well deserved. And uh, I can say, say that with uh, absolute honesty and hand on heart. You're so. very kind. So tell me then, Tony, let's go back to the very beginning why and when did you start your property investment journey? Well, <clears throat> genuinely don't think I've ever shared this before. Mm -hmm. um, the truth is I, I had a, a pretty successful kitchen company that I ran for 21 years. And uh, something happened in 2012 that kind of shook up everything in my world. And it was the fact that somebody who'd worked for me since our kitchen company down in Poole, where I live, uh, he died. He, uh, he died at the age that I am today, which is 53 old at, in 2012. Mm. And for me, that really changed everything. It made me start to look at things in a completely different way. I realized that if I didn't start taking a different view on what I was actually doing with my time, if something was to happen to me, my family probably wasn't actually 
going to be okay because we had a really good income coming in from the kitchen company, sort of you know, six figure income. We had uh, six guys working for me, uh, five guys and a girl, I should say. Uh, things were really good. But if something happened to me, my income stopped. So I had to make a change. So um, 2012 was when that happened. Uh, I immediately decided to jump in and get myself educated. I'd sort of dabbled in property before, yeah. but I thought I've got to get myself educated properly. Uh, and as you know, I committed to Simon Zucci's year-long mastermind program. Um, I had a, a uh, uh, I had an odd start to the first, and I share this with people that ask. I was kind of half in kitchens, half in property for the first uh, six months of that program. Um, but eventually something happened that really sort of kicked me and made me really commit 100% to property. Um, and then I then spent sort of three years building my portfolio until I got myself to the place where I actually had a really nice income, a really good income coming in from property, certainly comparable with my kitchen company. But I wasn't really doing a lot. And that was kind of where I found myself in around about sort of 2015, 2016. Um, so that's really the kind of abbreviated backstory of, of how I sort of changed from kitchens to property. Right. Um, so what was now, it? I mean, that's an interesting insight that, you know, someone like Clo was close to you. Yeah. It, yeah. It away. Was, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just to say it's, it's just that someone's close to you, passes away. But. You know, that doesn't just, I guess that doesn't go from, well, I, I'm now not going to be doing kitchens and now I'm property because that's really just trading one thing for another. So what was the, what was the kind of the psychology behind, well, this is, this is now kitchens and this is property apart from, you know, if something should happen to you, but you could argue that could happen in property, could you not? Uh, you're absolutely right. But again, what I haven't shared before is that I saw the, the partner of the person that passed away, you know, they weren't in a particularly good place in terms of financially. Obviously, they weren't in terms of their relationship. This all goes without saying. But yeah. in terms of financially, I saw that this this was not a good thing. This was not a good place to be. Putting aside the emotion for a second, mm. this was not a good place to be in a financial sense. And I realized that I needed to kind of create something that was going to put, I, I really hesitate to use the words passive income because <laughs> I really don't think property is ever that. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure you'd agree there. But it certainly, I needed something that would kind of just keep chugging away as a bit of a money-making machine yeah. um, that would just put money in my pocket each and every month. And property certainly does that. It'd never be fully passive. No. And I don't know that I'd want it to be, if I'm being honest with you. I kind of like getting in and meddling with it from time to time. <laughs> but it certainly is a world away mm. from going out to see Mr. and Mrs. Jones at 10 o'clock at night who's changed the colour of their doors for the fifth time. <laughs> right, no, which is what I was doing uh, yeah. up until I got involved in property. And I guess by having property, it's one of those things. Yes, you're going to have tenants, but you can you can put systems in place for that. But yeah, you, you mentioned the fact that you you've got choice whether you go out to work today or not, and then that's that's the big difference that property can really give to you. Absolutely, absolutely. And and the reality is, I was working some very long hours. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm being really honest, in the property sense, when I'm not actually involved in buying or doing something with the property. Mm -hmm. I don't really do an awful lot, which is a nice thing to say. I used to have guilt about that, about a guilt about not working. Mm. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but um, I think when you go from working very hard or, or what I perceive to be working very hard, at least it was by my standards, to kind of not doing a lot with your day and actually sort of starting to, to, to find other things to put into your day, mm. things that you really wanted to do, you know, stuff that maybe, um, you know, it might just be going for a walk with your wife or kids or going down to the beach or something like that. It's, it's very different <laughs> to I, I, the kind of uh, days that I was having. <laughs> I think, I think you, you, you highlighted a point though, is that you're not trading your time for more work. No, you're trading your time for family time. And that's if people were being truth and honest with themselves, it would be, I would want to spend more time with yeah. my friends and family more than in one. Fact, in fact, if I could share one little thing, um, mm. I, 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 uh, again, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but I remember very specifically the first deal that I did or the first property that I bought, which I, I, um, I bought from somebody who was a motivated seller. I was able to come up with a solution that worked really well for them. Mm. They're still my Facebook friend today, I'm pleased wow. to say. But the significant part of it was 
and I'm not going to go into what I did because I don't want to eat up too much of your time, but the significant part of it was it put £383 in my pocket each and every month. Mm. Now, there's a whole backstory to this, which I won't bore you with, but it was the idea that I wasn't doing anything and £383 came into my pocket each month. That kind of blew me away. It, it really changed everything as far as I was concerned. And I kind of thought, well, actually, I kind of like that. I'll do more of this. <laughs> and it's so, amazing how much money you can make in property, though, if you put your mind to it. Yes, but I don't have I don't have a huge portfolio, and I'm not going to pretend that I do. I have a portfolio that gives me a really good income, but it's not a massive portfolio in terms of quantity. Mm. Um, but I've tried to sort of keep my loan to value down. Uh, uh, some of my properties don't have mortgages on them, um, as you probably know, as being my accountant. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm kind of really happy with where I'm at now. Do I want more property? Yes, I do, but I'm not. Uh, it's, it's not essential now for me uh, to, to continue to build and build and build my portfolio. And I think that it shouldn't be that. I don't think people should continue to invest, invest, invest with no end in sight. I think you get to a point where you think, well, actually, that's enough. Yeah. Now I'd like to go and do X with my time. Do you know, it's really interesting. I had a, a couple that came into my into our office talking about their property portfolio and uh, the, the husband um was all about building his property portfolio and they had in mind that uh, and i'm not going to go to the numbers but they had a, a figure in mind that they wanted to achieve per month and uh the, the wife was pretty much kind of happy with where they were financially they had the she had she was involved in the property business as well uh mm -hmm. but he said oh, i wanted this amount of money when we calculated how much he, they could have by just doing some tweaks to their financial and tax structure they've already achieved their financial goal and some, right, right? by yeah. about 20%. And it's like crazy. It was like, so what are you doing? It's like, well, I'm building this portfolio. Like, but for what? What are you doing it for? You've already got what you want. He says, well, surely we, we, we've got to keep on growing. And said, well, why don't you uh, tell me about your own house? Isn't that interesting? And he piped up saying, we haven't done our house for 12 years. Every time we put money, it's fine. <laughs> we've always put it in another buy to let. And I'm saying, well, what, what is it that you would like Ooh. out of life? And she said, do you know what? I've always wanted a place in Barcelona. And do you know, the tr tr truth to them, three months later, after I had that frank conversation with them to say, you don't need any more. You just need to rationalize. You need to pay down your debts now. You don't need to keep building portfolios. I always say, that, you know, you could have, why have uh, one property, sorry, why have four properties, which has got four tenants, four lots of letting agents where you can have one property that's delivering the same amount of money. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, and that's exactly what they did. And, you know, she went, she came back quite gladly and said, do you know, thanks for that pep talk. I've now got a property in Barcelona and, and we're planning to use it every month at least. And that was a great story. So it's well, I think clearly you need to go into marriage counseling as well. <laughs> as a kind yeah. of add on to accountancy. Well, maybe, maybe, <laughs> but uh, moving swiftly on from that. <laughs> sorry. Um, so what property strategies did you start with and how have they changed over time? Okay, so I, um, I kind of got very good. There's lots and lots and lots of things that I'm awful at, but as my wife will tell you, but I got kind of quite good at actually buying uh, and negotiating really good below market value deals. Right. So that's very much how I started out. And I still really fly the flag for that. But and that's how I started out. So basically, I started uh, putting marketing material out there, kind of to a certain extent, you name it, I've sort of tried it. Everything from all the stuff you shouldn't do, stuff like bandit boards and lampposts, which we don't even talk about these days, through to direct mail and everything in between. I did lots of that sort of stuff. And it, and it worked. It worked. It's, it's frowned upon now. Other strategies are coming to play now, which have, uh, are, are really sort of tend to be in the forefront. But the reality is the stuff I was doing was genuinely working. Mm -hmm. And it enabled me to kind of get direct in front of sellers. Now, I guess it could be argued I have a little bit of an advantage having been one of those slippery, slimy kitchen salesmen for 21 years, <laughs> uh, second only to double, in, uh, to double glazing and insurance salespeople. I kind of, I know how to sit down with, with, with somebody and, and have a genuine chat to them. And, and it is a genuine chat. It's not, I don't drop into some sales mode. I have a, a nice chat with somebody in the kitchen and I was able to find win-win solutions again 
an overused phrase, win-win solutions, can you really do that? Well, yes, you can. You really can find solutions that work for a seller that also work really well for you. Never used to believe it. Uh, ask Simon Zucci that. He will tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> he will tell you a great story about me marching up to him and saying, oh, I don't believe this stuff works, but it does work. Yeah. And so, um, I, actually was re I remember that story when I was on the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he uses it too much, uh, but it's true. <laughs> he's absolutely right. I cannot question him. He's absolutely right. And um, that's the reality of the situation. I started to get good at finding, uh, uh, connecting direct with sellers, um, not going through agents, getting mm. direct with sellers, uh, putting stuff out there that generated leads, uh, sat down with these people and yeah, I was able to negotiate some really good deals, getting a good discount from, um, from, those, uh, from those deals. And obviously the advantage of that is you can then refinance, pull your money out relatively quickly. So you can use that money to go and invest again and again and again. Mm. Um, however, the reality is I did take a bit of a shotgun blast at the world of property investing. So I've kind of got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, or I've had a bit of this and I've had a bit of that. Right. And actually, I don't think that's the right way to do it, if I'm being honest with you. I think you need to be more intelligent than my initial approach. I think you need to be more laser focused um, in the strategies that you do moving forwards. Um, if I had my time again, I would focus on one strategy and one strategy alone, whatever that strategy was. Yeah. Um, for me, I kind of am really happy with interacting with tenants, for example. I kind of like that. Some people don't, but I kind of like that. Um, so I would choose a strategy that enabled me to focus in a very specific geographical area right. and, and, and uh, look for specific properties in that specific area. Mm. That's an interesting insight because I think when I was on Simon Zucci's, um, it, the, I remember the flow chart of the kind of every deal can work. And I think that's true to a point. Uh, but I, I must admit when I kind of after about a year, two years, I went back to my other coach talking about laser like focus, which mm. is focus on one thing. Don't be a multitasker, be a yeah. unitasker. Um, you know, do one thing and do it really, really well, which is, a, I remember reading a book by Jim Collins, not the singer, not Phil Collins, but Jim Collins. Okay. Uh, he wrote a book by, uh, called good to great. Uh, and one of the things that he said about shiny pennies, which is what someone says she calls them, is, um, you know, the enemy of the great is the good. So every time people talk about good deals, I always say, yeah, but is it a great deal? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> makes them ask the question, you know, is it, what, is it the best, most, one of the best deals? So it's interesting how you're right. I think it does change you. You learn a lot, don't you, in terms of um, what you have and how you, you approach things going forwards. And, that probably much brings me to a nice little question. Uh, what major change, uh, challenges have you faced? And what have you learned from them? Because every, with every down, there's always an up. Um, oh, I've had loads of downs. And I really, because, um, yeah, I mean, I've had loads of challenges um, uh, over the years. Um, but actually, from a purely business standpoint, uh, the one biggest challenge that I didn't see coming right. was... I had this really good vanilla, boring, in a way, kitchen company that was giving me a good income. I was highly mortgageable. Right. Suddenly, that thing happened that I talked about earlier on, you know, changed direction. I'm now going off in this direction now over here. I'm going to do this property stuff. Mm. Suddenly, overnight, I became unmortgageable. And I did not see that coming. Right. So the big, that was, that was, that really kind of stunted my growth for want of a better phrase in those days when I was really trying as much, as much as I could to get growth. It really stopped me in my tracks. And, and so the big thing that I always tell people now, whenever I go to any events, when anyone, anyone ever asks me, you know, I'm thinking about giving up the day job and getting into property full time. I, I, I kind of, I sometimes wonder or worry if I go in too hard, I say, stop, rethink that. This has been my experience. Might it be yours? Mm. Um, you need to remain highly mortgageable, I would suggest, until your property-based income uh, has matched or indeed surpassed the yeah. income that you're doing from your day job, be you, whether you're self-employed or whether you're somebody else. You didn't have the uh, foresight, intelligence, whatever you want to call it, to really think about that. And it really stopped me in the track. So that was really my biggest challenge um, and I would suggest anybody that's thinking about giving up the, the day job 
And uh, as I say, that could be self-employment. It could be working for somebody else. It could be whatever, a business of your own. Really think long and hard before you do that because it probably will make you unmortgageable in a moment. Yeah, that's... That's really interesting because I've had several conversations myself uh, with people saying, I'm, I really want to give up my job. Uh, and again, a snippet from Jim Rohn's books when he talks about have this part-time job thing going on, uh, where he talks about his building up his sales uh, business. But ultimately, he, he maintained a job and he always said, you know, his, his part-time sales job was earning him more money than his full-time job. Yeah, but this is this is Jim Rowan you're talking about, yeah. isn't he? Jim is. Rowan is awesome. He's an awesome, awesome guy. But he was that. I think it's that learning that he had even on those early days was never give up your the bread and butter of earnings first. Mm. Make sure that you have something substantiated. And I think Tony, you pretty much hit the nail on the head by never giving up your 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 main income first. Just before we jump onto your next question, can I sure. just chip in there, actually? You, you, you've mentioned two or three times here quotes from other people. And yeah. um, can I also just add that um, that has just made such a big difference to me, reading business-based books, not property-based books, actually. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some brilliant property books out there, and we won't mention any here <laughs> for fear of sort of upsetting the people that we forget to mention. but. Yeah. Honestly, other personal development type books, you know, have made a massive difference to me, a massive impact to me. Um, you know what? I'm going to have to mention one book, my best book of all time, which is, uh, I'm always slightly embarrassed when I share it, is How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, Dale Carnegie, right? Of course. Um, I'm always slightly embarrassed because the title, the title is just bizarre. You tell somebody that's what you're reading, they'll go, what? Yeah. Um, best book I've ever read. But that, that type of learning, that type of... Um, you know, higher level reading from people who are just, you know, kings of their field. Everyone should be doing that. Audio book is fine. Old fashioned paperback is just as fine, but I think we should all do that. Yeah, or or both. both, ideally both. I, 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 must, I have to admit, I have to have both because audio books are great when you're uh, chilling out, uh, but actually there's nothing like a good book. I write copious notes on my books as well. So I always go to the back of the books and the index pages, I start to write insert notes of my own. And Absolutely. In fact, one of, my, one of my proudest things is, I never forget, I picked up a copy of um, how to, uh, my old, old copy of How to Win Friends and Influence People, just talking about that one particular book. Mm. And I started to flick through it. And I noticed that all these, li- there were lots of uh, sections have been underlined. I hadn't underlined them. Oh. My son, Stephen, had picked up the book. And without me knowing it, it sat on my shelf for sort of six, 12 months. He'd wow. been reading it. He'd been unli- underlining sections. Wow. And so how powerful is that? And so, yeah, you need to read up, pick up those manual books and, and, and underline the sections that are significant to you. No, absolutely. So in terms of your proudest achievements, come on, Antonio, let's give it, let's start with the personal one, because I think that's always better, to be fair. Our business achievements are one thing, but what's your personal proudest? My personal one is my, I've overcome, I, I feel I've overcome my fear of, um, public speaking um i've always people perceive me to be far more confident than i actually am when it comes to standing in front of people or doing anything live uh, you this this what we're doing right now i mean I've, I've put lots of content out there over the years whatever this is the very first time i have ever done anything like this that we're doing now simon you know and i'm doing it because i trust you and yeah thank you i know you're a good stand-up guy and um but i'm not going to deny it. I'm, I'm nervous in delivery because i've always had a fear of public speaking and um i've been very fortunate to stand up and head up some quite big events i, I head up uh, i headed up bournemouth pin for mm. six years i did wow. simon switches i headed up simon switches graduates program which i know you were a part of yeah, yeah. um and I go into that room and people would maybe not see the fear that was there until I told them about it. Until maybe they saw my shirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's always the biggest giveaway. That guy's a little bit nervous uh, if you're having to ring me out at the end of the day. So that was my biggest personal um, kind of achievement. Uh, I, just, I mean, the thing is, though, Tony, I mean, do you find that having a little bit nervous, doesn't that just show that you care and you want to give the very best to the, the audience? That you're in I front? couldn't agree with you more. And I've watched endless in, in my aim to overcome this challenge. I've watched endless YouTube videos and, and I've, you know, a, 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 a loads of stuff I could bore you with. I tried to get over this, this fear. And, um, 
Absolutely. It's essential to actually make sure you deliver good stuff. And, and I think I can say with a, a, a small degree of confidence, maybe, that, that I can actually stand at the front of the room now and I can be quite cheeky. That was my style. I'm cheeky with the room. I'll take the mickey a little bit. But with, with love, with care, just having a bit of fun yep. um, with the people that are in the room and get away with it. Um, but that's practicing and that's, that's something that, um, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to go on about it, but that was be my biggest, my biggest fear to overcome. Yeah, and um, just to add to that though, Tony, I think when I, especially when I've listened to you and various other people, there's people out there that like, like you, Andy Haynes, um, oh yeah, Andy Haynes. Yeah, <laughs> wow. But I think there are genuine people. Uh, you guys have been genuine. You're all caring, and people buy into you. And I think sometimes it's one of those. You may know your stuff, but actually, people are buying into you first, first and foremost. And you have got that trusting aura about you. Well, that's very kind. Thank you. you. So <laughs> it's been always been a pleasure to to listen to you. So talk about business then. So what's your best business achievement? I've got two. Um, wow. I was thinking about this. The first one was um, pretty nuts and boltsy. And that was, um, it was the ability to be able to replace my kitchen company income right. with my property rental income. Um, I struggled to, to do it. Um, I, I, I perceived everybody around me was doing it really, really quickly. Um, but I struggled in those early days to kind of get that going. But now I've got myself to a place where my rental income is really quite good. I'm very happy with where it's at now. So that was my, 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 my first business achievement. And my second business achievement was actually the starting up of my um, kind of YouTube channel and my page, which is your first four houses, yeah. um, I, uh, which is something that I'm quite proud of because – um, I'm, I'm now able to generate some stuff that I can kind of put out there that I sincerely hope helps everybody else who is working at a nine to five or that eight to six type job, maybe feeling a little bit like there's got to be something better out there. And I hope that the stuff that I'm now kind of putting out and sharing with people is actually kind of making them just think for a minute, actually, do you know what? I can do this. This is possible. Um, and so, yeah, your first four houses is something is my second kind of business achievement. I'm, I'm and, uh, just proud to of. give people a bit of a heads up. What's the YouTube channel called? If you just go onto YouTube and just simply search for your first four houses, that's F O U R, your first four houses. If you go and do that, um, you'll hopefully find a fair weight of, of content on there that's that's mine. And um, can I be so bold as to say, subscribe? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, because I, sh <laughs> I share sort of content every week um but i love doing it i love doing it i i kind of think of something that i think actually that might be really kind of beneficial or helpful um and so uh i've got one coming out this thursday which is all about how property investors should approach the summer months Oh. So I kind of think about little challenges or little ideas I think will genuinely help people. Right. And then I craft a little video around it and I kind of put it out there and, and people are very kind. For everyone listening in right now, if you want to know more about property investing in the summer months, make sure you go on to Tony. <laughs> Subscribe now. Go do the finger. Yeah, absolutely. That's Thank brilliant. you. Um, so in terms of risks, uh, obviously there's lots of risks right now. We're talking about you know, in the future, especially what we don't know what's going to always happen. Uh, but what are the, the risks that you can foresee for property investors and how can you help them? Well, the, the truth is, I think that you have got um, probably a, a more um, accurate finger on the pulse of where things are going, maybe, Simon. Being a property-based accountant, mm -hmm. you of all people are probably right in there, the sharp end of, 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 where, of um, the risks that are out there. The big one, though, that I think everybody needs to be aware of, this is just my thoughts. Mm -hmm. You might have different thoughts, and other, certainly other people listening in may have different thoughts, is, is potentially an oversupply in some areas of HMO rooms. Yeah. I, th I know, because I interact with a lot of newer property investors and, and a lot of established investors as well, I, I can say with a high degree of confidence there are some parts of the country now where there is an oversupply of rooms. Mm. Reading mm -hmm. being one of them. 
Red, well, okay, yeah, absolutely. I can think of a few, but I don't want to sort of drop them in. But I can think of Reading's, I think you're absolutely right. But we won't mention any others. Well, oh, I won't anyway. You go ahead, it's your channel. Yeah. But I think there is, a, there is a real challenge there. Um, mm. I, don't get me wrong, the right HMO in the right location to the right standard will probably always rent out. But, yeah. but I think if you're on the periphery, if you're not offering something that's that's up to the mark, if you maybe haven't gone sweet rooms, mm. um, and I'm not suggesting that every HMO has to have on suite rooms. I'm not by any imagination. But if you've got two HMOs next to each other, one has, one hasn't, and there's not a lot of difference in cost. Well, I think you're at risk there. And more and more property investors are upping the game. They're, they're, they're upping the quality of their rooms. You've probably got to look on some of the forums, the Facebook forums, to see the quality is improving and the quantity is too. So um, my big advice there is to really do your research before picking out a specific area to actually invest. If HMOs is your strategy, and we can talk about lots of different strategies, but if HMOs is yours, really think hard. Because there are areas where there is still a strong demand, mm. but not much of a supply. Or if there is a supply there, uh, the quality is low. So uh, that's my biggest risk, I think. Okay. I mean, that's, that's interesting about what you say about uh, properties, because whenever I look at uh, our business, we always focus on Apple being the, I always call it the Apple standard. Yes, um, I've heard you mention this. Yeah. Um, so from a, perspe a property perspective, you know, we've got to remember what, what happened before the iPhone came out. You know, Nokia was the dominant force of mobile phones, as was Motorola. And they had many variety of phones, maybe two, three hundred variety of phones between those two companies. And yeah. Apple did one phone. <laughs> and now look at who's winning, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, there you are. So it's not about quantity, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, it's about having the right quality of product out there. And the other thing that I love was uh, Seth Godin. He talked about the purple cow of marketing. Yes, of course. You heard this one? Oh, if, if I was in the other room, I could reach out and put that in front of the camera as yeah. well. Uh, awesome. But he talked about, you know, in terms of um, a bit like properties, but if you're driving by a farm and you see plenty of brown cows, no one really cares about those brown cows after a period of time. But if, some, if there's a purple cow amongst brown cows, all of a sudden people will be crashing their cars thinking, what the heck is that? And it's the unique offering that people can have. And again, liken it to property investing. If you've got a fantastic room that is tailor-made for that type of that, and you've got to think about the type of person that you're investing for. Totally. Retenanting your property and what is going to be the wow factor for them. And we've done that with our rooms is that we've done, always done plush rooms. It's always a warm feeling when you're in there, thick carpets because we want professionals to feel when they've, they've done a hard job that they're coming home to just to relax. And please note Absolutely. the word home as opposed to a house. And also you can think about certain key niches, can't you? For example, one of the HMOs that I got, I actually designed it. Um, I, have to, I have to be really honest here and say, well, actually, let me, let me tell the brief story first. I actually sure. designed it to cater for nurses. Okay. Not for any particular reason, I hasten to add, but yeah. <laughs> I decided to cater for nurses. How did I do that? Well, I really built up the sound insulation to an incredibly high standard. My mm. thoughts were this would be appealing for nurses renting, sort of, you know, uh, working 24-hour shifts. Or, or, or odd night shifts, shall we say, yeah. they wouldn't disturb each other. Um, and ultimately, that's how I started renting that particular one out and marketed it direct to the um, to the hospital. And and it was an angle. It was that purple cow in a way. Mm. It was designed to appeal to a very specific niche of people. Um, it's, it's, it's actually uh, occupied by lots of other people now, but uh, that's how it started off. So, yeah, you're right. You've got to have the right property to the right standard in the right location, and you'll still rent it. But yeah. the fact remains that it is still, I feel, a little bit of an oversupply in certain areas now yeah i agree that's good to hear and uh 2018 we're nearly halfway through uh well we are more than halfway through 2018 heading towards 2019 dare we say it uh but what major changes do you expect to see obviously you talked about oversupply do you see there's any changes in the world of property investing you know with brexit and Section 24 and the mortgage companies needing 145%. Do you think there's going to be a, a shift to the way that people generally invest in property? 
to be honest with you, I haven't got a lot that I can contribute to this particular point. Okay. Um, I don't want to pretend, I don't want to sort of fluff this one out. The truth is, I, I mean, the, the biggest challenge that I think at the moment is that I think it's obviously becoming more difficult to sell certain types of properties. We found that we've got a property in, in Highgate, for example. Um, it's being really challenging trying to find a buyer for that. Right. Uh, we've got that sorted now, but um, I don't want to sort of contribute a lot more to this particular no, point because I, I don't, I don't particular I don't have a, um, uh, I can't really envisage, I don't have, what's the phrase, a ball? I can't think of the right phrase, a ball, where you look into it and you can visualize, crystal a, a crystal ball, thank you for that, Simon. I don't have a crystal ball, obviously we all know where the market is going in terms of Brexit, there's a lot of negativity out there, mm. but I can't say categorically which way it's ultimately going to go, I just mm. don't know. Mm. No, fair enough. And, and you're right. I don't think anyone have got a crystal ball in terms of that. Uh, but it, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, I, I, I'd actually, if, this, if we were turn this question around, I would love to ask you that question. <laughs> well, okay. So, I mean, from my side of things, I'll, we have quite a few clients, as you imagine, with property investing. And the, the biggest shakeup that we're now seeing is people moving towards service accommodation, holiday lets, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of call for that right now in terms of the tax breaks, what, what are the advantages. People are now investing in limited companies. But I think if you talk about strategy, types of property strategies, people are going to bigger HMOs, but mm-hmm. better quality ones. So Julie Marie, so I've spoken to quite a few times. A very good there's guy. Great uh, stuff. Look, my wife, I was worried at one point that she might run off with him. Uh, <laughs> She, you know, she, you know she talked about ditto. Yeah, she 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 had the manual next to her at bed, so, yeah, teasing one. her. Yeah, exactly. And I just thought, well, okay. But there, you know, it's it's uh, it's that. I think that's where people are going. You've already said it, Tony. The people are going to high quality rooms. Mm. They do demand that nowadays. I remember when I was a student going to uh, to to live in one of my student houses. Um, and I was quite happy the fact that it didn't have fleas, you know? Um, <laughs> Tick. Yeah, exactly. And, and nowadays you kind of hear people say, well, I demand a, a, a blue screen TV, you know, with 3D, whatever else. And then I want modems and I want always on internet broadband connection. I yeah. want this, I want that. And the demands are coming so rapidly now. And I think it's just that side has changed as well in terms of what people demand. Since, since, since we turn this uh, this conversation around, and I'm now asking the question, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked briefly about the oversupply of or the potential. Let's just let's phrase it the o- the potential oversupply, the mm. potential oversupply of HMO rooms. Yeah. Do you see a potential oversupply of service accommodation? Yes. Yeah. Too easy. So do I. And I think the risks associated with uh, the service accommodation is their local authority. They've already done it in in London, whereby they would ban any properties that are for residential use and then being converted into holiday lets. So there has been a widespread, Newham Council was the one who started that in London. Uh, that spread like wildfire across London. And I rather expect that cities will find the same thing as well, that there will be an oversupply. And I think the, 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 this is obviously neither of us the saying the service accommodation isn't a brilliant strategy. Of course, it's a brilliant strategy. It's a great way to maximise the income on any pro- on, on certain types of property. Of course, we're saying that. But I think sometimes we we hear lots of really positive noise about certain strategies. Mm. And I think sometimes we don't hear some of the other issues that are so associated with certain uh, uh, strategies. And of course, this all comes down at the end of the day to educating yourself properly. Um, there's loads of forms of loads of people out there that can, to, that can teach you this stuff. And again, we're not going to talk about any names here, but it's mm. so important to build your knowledge, build your education before you jumping in on any particular type of strategy. But I make the observation that I think service accommodation is one of those things. Might we be having a conversation in a year or two's time that goes along the lines of I'm seeing a real oversaturation of service accommodation in certain areas? Mm. I think we might. But anyway, I'll, I'll, hand the, the, I'll hand this back to you. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I think you mentioned one of the opportunities is education. Um, yeah. But the one thing I, I did hear, again, I was listening to a different audio book tonight from Seth Godin uh, whilst I was in the gym. Um, and he talked about the fact that if you 
if you go to these courses and you rope learn what they're teaching you, you are amongst the many. And what he was saying is actually what you've got to do is listen to the, the, the philosophies of what the teacher is teaching you, but take your own slant on it and make it unique. I think that's brilliant. I'm going to be honest with you and say, I haven't heard that before. And I love it. I think it's really good. I also, I do think though that there are certain key, when we talk about property education, I do think there are certain core elements that all of the training, there's loads of people out there that, that teach you how to invest in property. Like I'm one of them, but you know, there's loads of people out there, loads of really good other people out there as well. But there are always core things that you need to get really good at when it comes to building your knowledge in terms of, uh, of education. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, can I just share one, one tip yeah. that I think, because yeah. you've got down on the screen here, what are the opportunities to make money? Can I just share one thing that I think everybody should be doing right now? Good. And that is, and it sounds so weak when I tell people this, but it is so incredibly powerful. Um, in fact, just to really milk this cinematics one. Cinematics uh, movie sound. Correct? <laughs> yeah, we did a little bit of a drum roll going on the background. Well, <laughs> I've got a talk coming out. This is a talk that I'm be doing on the circuit on this one subject, and um, it's simply to walk around your investment area. Mm. Now, if I say it in that in that way, golly, do people sound disappointed? <laughs> but I had this a fan, I had this real epiphany recently. I was walking, I, I went out for a walk. Part of my family's in North London, in Barnet, in North London. Mm. Uh, I'm originally from Potter's Bar, but um, Barnet in North London. And I often talk, to, talk about walking around uh, your investment patch, your investment area, whatever you want to call it, mm. and looking, keeping your eyes open, looking for opportunities, looking for places where you could add some substantial value. Mm. I think this, this for me anyway, um, is, 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 is uh, a great opportunity to look around your investment area, go out for a walk, uh, and look for specific places to add value. So we're talking about places that you can turn from a house into flats. If you walk down a street and you see four terraced houses, house number one's got three doorbells and three wheelie bins, house number two's got three doorbells and three wheelie bins, house number three's got one doorbell and one wheelie bin, mm. I suggest they it into three flats. Or properties with really big gardens, there's a big long fence going down a side road. Could you get in on the, on the back there and actually build a house? If you think you can, put a leaflet through that person's door. We could talk endlessly about that, but I think in terms of opportunities, this is something that everybody should be doing right now. And this is not just referring to properties that are already on the market. I'm talking about all of those properties that aren't currently on the market. Just get out there and start connecting with people where you see potential opportunities. Oh, that's a good point, isn't it? Because people say that there's no deals because they go on to right move and they it, because the property doesn't say this is a great deal um, <laughs> no, that, that puts people off uh, but I, I think you're right a lot of deals aren't even on right move because there's totally, plenty of totally. buildings where i am and you kind of think well actually why isn't that on right move and you kind of think well that's because the maybe it's in probate maybe it's the hand of, of a pension fund and they just can't be bothered to do anything with it and you've got to but, think, but you know what simon i bet you um what, what, what is your hometown so I live in Nottingham. Okay. I, well, Nottingham. Okay. Well, I would imagine that within <laughs> a mile. Like that. that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Nottingham's amazing. No, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a dense conurbation of properties because what I was going to say here was, I've asked this question before and they say, they're in, somebody says I'm in the middle of the countryside and I go, oh, well, actually this, this next thing won't really hit home then. Hmm. But the point I was going to make was, I bet within a mile's radius of where you live, there are, um, there are loads of opportunities. You've got properties which, which have been empty for a year or two. You just yeah. haven't spotted them yet because you haven't walked around your investment area. You've got properties, as I say, with big gardens where you could maybe build on the back. Properties that need massive amounts of renovation. Properties that you could take and you could split into two and convert into two houses, four. Walk around your investment area, and I promise you will find lots of these types of opportunities. Yeah. Just one thing, Tony, your voice has gone really quiet, and bless you, it'd be good to hear more of that. So, Oh, think, I'm so I, sorry. No, I think I we caught the back end of it. But, uh, but sorry about but that. I got Is that the, okay? 
Yeah, but I, the the gist of it was to walk around your your estate and make sure that there yes. are you know there are plenty of deals. So I, I think you're absolutely right about that, and and I think that's a, a lesson that we can all learn from. Now it does a you know this I've always done these kind of uh, events whereby you know one other thing I always say is we never accept any kickbacks or commissions, and the reason why I got Tony on tonight is because by God we live in. Um, and and we do think that it does give a huge amount of value. I think you've already heard that tonight. But I, I did say to Tony, go on, sell me your courses, go on, because ultimately I'm not here for taking kickbacks or commissions. I'm not really interested in that kind of stuff. I really promote people. I don't re- I don't promote products as such. I always say the person's name that I believe in, and Tony wouldn't do it. So uh, so what I asked Tony to do is just keep on banging on about the YouTube channel which you can subscribe. Uh, so your first four houses, if I hopefully I've got that right there, Tony. Um, so make sure that you, you go got that on. bang on right. Yeah, that's, Good. What, that was, that's what I'd love people to do. Good. So if you can subscribe to Tony's channel and just maybe to put some comments. I've watched quite a few of, uh, of Tony's videos. I think it's one of those things that you should never stop learning uh, and equally don't think that you know everything because the little small nuggets that you get from someone else can be incredibly valuable. And that's why they call it golden nuggets, right? Because it's the value that they that learning gives to you. So please feel free to, to go that. But I just want to say thank you ever so much for Tony uh, for, for sharing his insights, his wealth of knowledge, which you can all learn from. Don't forget, as Thank I mentioned you. earlier at the beginning of the event, if you liked what you hear about the services that we can provide to you as a property investor, then feel free to go to optimizeaccountants.co.uk. There are two pages whereby, one, you can talk about our services, and the second one is whereby you can book a tax call to talk about your own personal tax affairs. Now, all that leads me to say is this amazing video. I thoroughly enjoyed having Tony with me. So thank you ever so much again, Tony. I salute you, sir. Uh, (laughs) This will be on the Optimize Accounts app. So if you are a client of ours, that app, you will be able to get this video webinar onto the app um, in a maybe a couple of nights at a time while I process it all through. But in a week's time, it will also be on the Optimize Accountants app and it will be part of the podcast as well. So make sure that uh, you've got access to, to that link. If um, you want to know more about uh, these type of events, people like Tony, um, I will be promoting all my events on our Facebook page. So make sure you like that Facebook page. It is the portal that I use to promote all of our events. So you can register your details there. And um, as I mentioned, if you like iTunes, we've got an iTunes uh, channel as well. So there's probably about 30 um, little podcasts now ready for you to listen to. Um, So feel free to go on that. And uh, if you're back onto YouTube and you're listening to Tony's uh, Your First Four Houses, uh, make sure once you've uh, done a couple of videos of Tony's, Maybe you want to understand a bit more of tax planning around Tony's ideas as well. That's when you can go to Optimize Accountants uh, YouTube channel and please subscribe on that as well. We have got another uh, webinar coming up uh, next week, next Monday, and that's an interview with Trevor Cutmore, another great guy who I've been speaking to a number of times. Um, I'm sure that would be just as, a, as fascinating from a different angle. Um, but, you know, again, Tony, I just want to say thank you ever so much. I know it took a bit of uh, a pluck of courage from your good self to come on this, but I'm delighted that uh, you, you took the stance and, and uh, joined me this evening. And uh, like I say, thank you ever so much. And I hope that uh, we can, subs- you know, we'll get as many subscribers to your YouTube channel as possible. You're very kind. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Simon. Good evening, guys. And uh, thanks again. And I shall see you all very soon. Cheerio now.